It's Lenten season, and we uh, have started a series of sermons on things that we all need to give up for Lent. Not just give it up for the Lenten season, this 40-day period before Holy Week, uh, but give up for the rest of our lives. So far, we've been admonished to give up control by submitting to the Lordship of Christ, and then also to give up unrealistic expectations, uh, trusting all outcomes to God as we simply walk in obedience to him. And today I'm going to ask you to give up an attitude, an attitude which few of us readily admit initially, but an attitude that I believe all of us fall to eventually. And today, let us consider giving up feelings of superiority. Give up feelings of superiority. The thing that makes this so difficult is that we all come by arrogance very naturally. The sin nature elevates self, sacrificing humility on the altar of our feelings. Even when we fight against self-promoting feelings, then we're in danger of feeling superior because of our great humility. And we look down on others who are just not quite as humble as we are. I'd like you to consider a parable with me that Jesus told his disciples later on in his ministry. It's in Luke chapter 18. If you want to follow that with us, Luke chapter 18, a short parable, just verses 9 through 14. And this is a parable that Jesus told his disciples, knowing what was in their hearts. He knew their attitudes needed a readjustment. Verse 9, Luke chapter 18. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So right away, notice who Jesus is addressing. First of all, he's talking to his disciples, and he's talking to his disciples who were living with a sense of their own self-righteousness. And this attitude of self-righteousness had caused them to treat the people around them with contempt. Now, contempt is not a word that we use a lot, but it's a very powerful word. It's, contempt is a powerful feeling of dislike for someone who is thought to be less worthy than we are, uh, someone who is inferior to us, someone who is undeserving of respect. I understand Jesus' disciples had been with him now for a couple years, uh, participating in his ministry, and they had been elevated in, their, in, in the minds of others because they were close to Jesus. Verse 10. Here's the parable Jesus wanted them to hear. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified, justified, made right in his heart, rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, in this story, on whom was the Pharisee focused? Think about it. On whom, who? Himself and other people, right? Extortioners, adulterers, 
okay? The tax collector, okay? So he's praying, and his mind is focused on him and these other people around him. On whom was the tax collector focused? He was focused on God. Now, the lesson here, <clears throat> beware of artificial lines that delineate superiority, okay? Because we all draw them, okay? But beware of artificial lines that delineate superiority. This is what the Pharisee did. He looked around to see who he outperformed, and he compared himself with them so that he could feel superior to them. Whereas to tax collector, he, <laughs> there was a line, and he just got on the same line, on the same side of the line as God did. And he saw his great need for mercy, and he cried out to God. Uh, when I was writing this, it reminded me of an incident that happened here in Baraboo a number of years ago. And the ministers in Baraboo had a ministerium at that time, which no longer exists. And uh, we were discussing whether or not to allow an openly practicing homosexual minister into our Christian ministerial association. In fact, this was the very last meeting of that ministerial group. One by one, we each voice our position, some of us appealing to submission to the word of God for the sake of peace and unity, and others appealing to cultural trends and compromise for the sake of peace and unity. After I had spoken, uh, one of the ministers rebuked me and he quoted Dietrich bon she quoted Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who had issued warnings to Christian leaders who drew lines in the sand which weakened the body of Christ. Now Bonhoeffer's concern, and I was familiar with the writing that she threw it at my face, very personally, it was interesting. Bonhoeffer's concern was for the inability of the church in Germany to stand boldly as one voice against Adolf Hitler and the Nazis. My response to her rebuke uh, came swiftly, and it kind of startled me how fast it came out of my mouth, and it brought all further conversation to an end in that meeting. The pointedness of my response was so concise I was sure the Lord was having the last word, not me. Because what came out of my mouth was not typical of what would come out of my mouth at a time like that. And the first thing I said was a reminder that Bonhoeffer would never have even considered the possibility of ordaining a practicing homosexual to any ministerial position. And for her to use his name to support that position was almost unthinkable. Secondly, the only, I said the only lines that any of us ought to be concerned about are the ones that God draws. And whatever line he draws, we would all be wise to get on the same side of that line as he is. The Pharisee was arbitrarily drawing lines all over the place with everybody he saw, designed to make himself look good. The tax collector simply drew close to the Lord, and he saw his need. In that same portion of scripture, we can see what to expect from God. Self-exalting individuals can expect God to humble them. Now, I'm just curious. I'm curious to know how many could stand with me in this room. And you don't have to stand. I just want you to think about it. Maybe even ask for a show of hands. How many of you, there was a time in your life where you thought you were it? Okay, you know what I mean? I mean, you really thought the world rose, the sun rose and set on you. 
and people are around to take care of you and you drew all your arbitrary lines in the sand and you felt good about yourself all the time and then God decided he wasn't going to allow you to live that way and he humbled you. Would you raise your hand if you've been humbled by God? Raise them right up high. Everybody else look around, okay? I mean, I'm assuming the 180 had lots of hands up down in the 180 too. But individuals that God has humbled, they can expect God to exalt them, to lift them up. That's why the Bible says God is the lifter of our heads. But he can't lift your head if you've already got it lifted, (laughs) you see. We live in a culture where everybody, it seems like, is looking down on everybody these days. It's nothing new, obviously. But it almost seems to me like in certain areas it's getting worse. It seems to be the nature of humanity. But the wealthy look down on the poor, and the poor look down on the wealthy. And the powerful look down on the weak, and the weak look down on the powerful. And they all blame one another for their problems. People of different races look down on people of other races. The upper class look down on the lower classes, and the lower classes look down on the upper classes. The white-collar workers look down on the blue-collar workers, and the blue-collar workers look down on the white-collar workers. Cowboys look down on the sodbusters, and the sodbusters look down on the ranchers. If you remember Oklahoma. And the lists go on, and the lists go on, and the lists go on. But know this. This is really important. In Christ, there can be none of that foolish thinking. It's just not allowable in Christ. If it's there, it is a sign that you are operating outside of Christ and not inside of Christ. For the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, cleanses us from all sin, and we who are in Christ stand as one unified by his Spirit. And all the ugly human delineations rooted in human arrogance, which bring division, bring factions, bring anger, bring strife, bring bitterness, brings jealousies, and all kinds of things make absolutely no sense anymore because of the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all of those things. And Christ will have none of it. A Christian's perspective is this. Our God is so absolutely and supremely superior that any human differences are so infinitesimal they cannot even be detected. Okay? We need to stand with God. Get his personage, his greatness, his authority, his power imprinted in our mind. And all these differences we see in us won't seem like anything anymore. Now, Jesus, as always, our example. Go to John chapter 4 with me, would you please? John chapter 4. I'm going to try to skip through this pretty quickly. It's a long portion of scripture. This has to do with the Samaritan woman. And Jesus sets our example. John chapter 4, let's start at verse 1. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees that had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria so that he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied from his journey, was sitting beside the well, and it was about the sixth hour of the day. Now, whenever, whenever you went from north to south in Israel, usually in Jesus' travel, from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem, in this, in, uh, not in the very south, but south to Jerusalem, you had to, if you went along in the hill country, you passed through Samaria. 
If you went down into the valley and walked along the Jordan River, then you came up into Jerusalem. Uh, and some, a lot of times Jews would try to avoid uh, going through Samaria because the Samaritans and the Jews were not kind to one another. Uh, but Jesus was going from south to north, going back to Galilee here. Uh, Verse 7, a woman from Samaria came to draw water at Jacob's well, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. And the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. You know, the bad blood between the Jews and the Samaritans was ancient here. The Samaritans were a race of people that were considered half-breeds by the Jews that came into being way back when Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom, about 722 B.C. The Assyrians who inhabited Israel took Jewish women who were not uh, carried off into captivity and remained in the land, thus starting a new race of people that were part Assyrian and part Jewish and part some other things. Uh, and the Jews considered them inferior because of this. Their religion, the Samaritan religion, was a strange hybrid between Judaism and the gods and the religions of uh, religious practices of Assyria. And they worshipped on a small mountain in Samaria called Mount Gerizim, which was uh, and still is there. And the Samaritans, even though there's not very many of them left, still worship on that mountain. Well, verse 10, Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Notice that both of them hail back to the Abrahamic line. Okay, okay. Both of them look back to that. And he says, Every, and Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I give him will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. And Jesus said to her, Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you have now is not your husband. And what you have said is true. And the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, Gerizim, but you say that in Jerusalem, that Jerusalem, in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. And Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain or in Jerusalem you will worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. And when he comes, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Now, I'm going to skip over a little bit here. Go down to verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in Jesus, believed in him, because of the woman's testimony to them. She said, he told me that he told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days, and many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. Now, was this just a one-time occurrence? 
this ministry that Jesus reaches out to a Samaritan woman, breaking all of the social norms of his day. First of all, that she's a Samaritan. Secondly, that she's a woman, because men did not address women in familiar ways like this, nor did they teach them like Jesus taught her. So was, what, what, was this just a chance meeting uh, that found a Samaritan woman in the right place at the right time, finding Jesus in just the right mood? Or was Jesus teaching his disciples something that needed to mark their own ministries? Was he laying the groundwork for teaching that he would reinforce over and over again? That as a follower of Jesus, at the foot of the cross, all of us stand together on the same spiritual plane. <laughs> and it is from that, that lowest point of absolute need, our death, if you will, that God lifts us up. This, by the way, is one of the great lessons of our baptism, of our water baptisms. There we all stand out in the water. We submit ourselves to the waters of baptism in death. And it is the power of God that resurrects us from the grave, doing that which we cannot do ourselves. Well, Jesus, the least of these. Consider now another incident that happened two years later. Jesus is once again passing through Samaria, only this time he's going from Galilee in the north to Jerusalem in the south. And the crowds still travel with him. And in Luke chapter 10, we're going to begin reading at verse 25. Luke chapter 10, verse 25. A lawyer stands up and puts Jesus to the test and says, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he, Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And the lawyer answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And Jesus said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But the lawyer, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell amongst robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed and left him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when, we, when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine. And then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever, whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. And then Jesus asked the young man, the lawyer, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell amongst the robbers? And he said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, when I was in seminary, we were taught a particular hermeneutic, hermeneutic as to how to deal with parables. And it wasn't until later on that I found out that the hermeneutic that I learned in seminary that I think is a wonderful hermeneutic was not the same hermeneutic that was used throughout most of Christian his history, especially by the church fathers. We were discouraged from, using, from use, taking scriptural passages like this and allegorizing them. But the early church father viewed this entire parable as an allegory, assigning significant meanings to each part of the parable. And I think they're spot on. And I wanted to share the allegory with you. I think it gives deeper meaning to what we just read. This is how the early church fathers, almost of one mind, understood this parable. 
The man who is robbed, stripped, and beaten uh, by the hardships of life is us. Okay? We are the ones who are left lying on the side of the road. The priest represents the law, which offers us no help. The Levite is the prophets, which offer us no help once we're in that condition. The Samaritan is Jesus. Jesus who gives of himself. Jesus who gives mercy. Jesus uh, who gives grace and binds up the wounds. The inn is the church where Jesus places us, where those who are beaten up can receive care and restoration until they are healthy again. And his promise is that he will return and make all things right. (laughs) Seems spot on to me. If Jesus does indeed mean this parable to be understood allegorically, who does he choose to play his part? No, his part. The Samaritan. The lowest of the low. See? There's a message in there for us, isn't there? Thus underscoring the virtue of humility for us. And his distaste for those who believe themselves to be superior to others. Ah, Blasted clock. Stand with me, would you please? So where are you? I know that Fighting back feelings of arrogance from time to time will probably always be something that I will have to deal with and that you will have to deal with. It is a seductive urge, but it is an ugly urge. And it is destructive and it brings pain and disfigurement to the bride of Christ. I'm going to ask you to pray in your hearts with me this prayer that would ask the Lord's help in helping us to give up feelings of superiority towards others. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, forgive us. Forgive us, Lord, when we berate others, especially when we do so, simply so that we will look good. Lord, forgive us when we honor ourselves when we blow our own horns because other people don't seem to be doing it for us. Lord, forgive us when we allow the success of others to cause us to become jealous. Lord, forgive us whenever we look down on others forgetting our own sinfulness and our need for you. And Lord, strengthen each of us to recognize our insecurities, those ones which tempt us to build ourselves up in the eyes of others. Lord, strengthen us to keep our eyes on you so that your unmatched magnificence will justify and humble us so that you can exalt us. And Lord, strengthen us to always seek the unity of the bond of peace in this church, allowing us to see one another through the eyes of of your compassion and your mercy. And all God's people said,